7,000 year plan of God. Because from the creation of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden to the end of the Messianic era is 7,000 years of time. There is a very important biblical principle that the God of Israel taught about the end of days in the very beginning in the book of Genesis. You see, in traditional Christianity, when you want to study Bible prophecy, you know what they want to open your book to? They want to go to the book of Daniel, Matthew 24, and Revelation. And if you understand the general principle that biblical history is prophecy, you know what most of the Bible is? It's a record of history. And so pretty much the whole Bible is prophecy. And the major book of Bible prophecy that explains and, and, and gives you the foundation of Bible prophecy and explains it in, in, uh, in a way um, that is expounded upon by the prophets is found in the book of Genesis. So in Isaiah chapter 46, verses 9 through 11, it says, Remember the former things of old. I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. Declaring the end, that is the end of days, from the beginning. And I have declared from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel will stand and I will do my pleasure. I have spoken it. When did he spoke it? In the beginning. But I will also bring it to pass. Bring what to pass? What he spoke in the beginning. I have purposed it. It's my plan. And I will do it. We also see this principle in Ecclesiastes chapter 1 verse 9. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 15. The thing that has been, that's history, is that which shall be, that's future. And that which is done, that is past, is that which shall be done, that's future. Because there's nothing that's got to happen in the future that hasn't already happened in the past or at least in type and shadow. That which has been history is now. You want to understand what's happening now? <laughs> it's already happened. And that which has already been, and that which is, is that which already has been. Because God requires that which is past. You know, one of the reasons I believe why believers in Yeshua as the Messiah have trouble reading what we call the Old Testament is because in their mind, it's perception, it's all about boring history. How many people love studying history in high school? You know, it's boring. But, if you, if, but it's because you don't understand what you're reading. You're reading about prophecy. You're reading about the end of days because God used history to explain what will be. Each day in creation represents 1,000 years of time. Psalm 90, verse 4. For a thousand years in your sight are as but yesterday or a day. A thousand years are but a day when it's past and as a watch in the night. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. Beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. If you... Look at the genealogies that are recorded in the Bible, and I have here from Adam to the flood, you will find that there is approximately 4,000 years from Adam to Yeshua. It's hard to get it exactly from the information given in the Bible, but you can come very close. And so Adam to Seth, 130 years, Genesis 5.3. Seth to Enos, 105 years, Genesis 5.6. Enos to Canaan, 90 years, Genesis 5.9. Canaan to Mahalil, 70 years, Genesis chapter 5.12. Mahalil to Jared, 65 years, Genesis 5.15. Jared to Enoch, 162 years, Genesis 5.18. Enoch to Methuselah, 65 years, Genesis 5.21. Methuselah to Lamech. 187 years, Genesis 5, 25. Lamech to Noah, 182 years, Genesis 5, 28 and 29. Noah to the flood, 600 years, Genesis 7, 6. And if we continue on to Abraham, we have from Abraham, or we have from Adam to Abraham, 1948 years. You know what's interesting about the number of years from Adam to Abraham? In our calendar of how we're recording time, the birth of the nation of Israel is when in our calendar, 1948. And then from Abraham to Isaac, 100 years. Isaac to Jacob, 60 years. Jacob to Egypt, 130 years. So from Abraham to Egypt, 290 years. Now, Jacob went to Egypt, Genesis 46, verses 8 and 11. Levi, who is Jacob's son, went to Egypt. Kohat, who is Levi's son, went to Egypt. 
And so we have Kohat being recorded as going to Egypt. Moses is the grandson of Kohat. We only have from Kohat to Amram and Amram to Moses till we have the one who brings them out of Egypt. That's only two generations. And then from Moses to the Exodus is 80 years. They were in the wilderness 40 years, in the wilderness to the death of Joshua 30 years. For the, so the wilderness to the death of Joshua, 70 years. Now we have the period of the judges, and if you look at the period of the judges, we're told from Judges to Samuel in Acts chapter 13, verse 20, 450 years. Then if we look at the reigns of the kings of Judah, beginning with Saul and then finishing up with Zedekiah, you have 513 years. And history tells us that the Babylonian captivity took place in 586 B.C. And so if we add all this up, we come to around 4,000 years. So we can biblically validate from Adam to Yeshua 4,000 years. Now there's an illusion that Yeshua would come after 4,000 years of time in the very first book of the Bible. The very first book of the Bible, um, the very first chapter and verse of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, in English is, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. In Hebrew... It is Breshit bara Elohim et Hashemayim ve'et Ha'aretz. And it consists of seven words. And if you look at the fourth word, which I have highlighted for you, it is Aleph and Tav. The first and the last letters of the Hebrew alphabet. Who is Aleph and Tav? It's Yeshua the Messiah. And so the Aleph and the Tav appear as the fourth letter in Genesis 1.1, alluding to that Yeshua would come after 4,000 years of time with, with each uh, word representing 1,000 years of time. Yeshua is called the, Al, the Alpha and the Omega or the Aleph and the Tav in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 8. The Sabbath is the seventh day of creation. Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all the work which he had made. The seventh day Sabbath of creation foreshadows the thousand year messianic period. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8 and verse 10. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. So before he makes his statement, he prefaces it with, don't be ignorant. But like Paul prefaced his statement in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, don't be ignorant, and we're ignorant about what he said following, we're also ignorant about what is written here in 2 Peter 3, 8. So one day is with the Lord a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. Now verse 10, but the day of the Lord. How long is the day of the Lord? Before he tells you about the day of the Lord, he says, don't be ignorant that one day is with the Lord a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day, but the day of the Lord. How long is the day of the Lord? It's a thousand years. But I want you to notice what he says about the day of the Lord. It will come. The beginning of the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. The day of the Lord starts in darkness. You know what we call the darkness part of the day of the Lord? The tribulation. The Messianic era begins with the tribulation because the Messianic era is the day of Messiah, the day of the Lord, and it comes as a thief in the night. The tribulation. Uh, and the darkness part of the day of the Lord. So um, why is most believers in Yeshua's Messiah got to be asleep when the Messianic era begins or the day of the Lord begins? Because they've been taught that the Messianic era begins when Yeshua sets his feet down on the Mount of Olives and then we start counting a thousand years. But the day of the Lord begins as a thief in the night. It's, it begins with tribulation. But how do we recognize that, that it begins? Well, the prophets are going to give you events that happen the day of the Lord in the tribulation, so that when these events happen, you can recognize that you're in the day of the Lord because initially people won't recognize they're in the day of the Lord. And that's what I'm going to be showing you is what are those events, those significant events that we can watch and know that we're in the tribulation. 
The Sabbath is the seventh day, Exodus chapter 20, verses 9 and 10. Six days shall you labor, do your, all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord. You see, the Messianic era is the time when the earth has got to rest after laboring for six days or, or 6,000 years. You see, every time you celebrate the weekly biblical Sabbath, you're declaring your belief in the coming of the Messiah in the Messianic era. Because that's what it foreshadows. So the seventh day Sabbath is the day of the Lord. Isaiah 58 verse 13. If you turn away your foot from the Sabbath. From doing your pleasure on my holy day. So the Sabbath is called my holy day. And called the Sabbath the delight. The holy of the Lord honorable. So the Sabbath is my holy day. Or the Sabbath is the holy of the Lord. Or the Sabbath is the day of the Lord. Because that's the day when Messiah gets glorified. And he's king over all the earth. It's his day. It's the day of the Lord. So the seventh day Sabbath is, uh, is connected to the day of the Lord, which is associated with the Messianic era. And the darkness part of the Messianic era is the tribulation. Now let's look at some verses with the prophets describe and tell us about the day of the Lord. Isaiah 13, verse 6. How ye for the day of the Lord is at hand, it will come as destruction from the Almighty. The beginning of the day of the Lord comes as destruction, tribulation. And they shall be afraid. Pains and sorrows will take a hold of them. So what we're being told is the day of the Lord is the time of pain and sorrow. What do we call the time of pain and sorrow? Tribulation. Zephaniah 1 verses 14 and 15. The great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hastens greatly. Even the voice of the day of the Lord, the mighty men will cry their bitterly. That day, the day of the Lord, is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation. Desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. The day of the Lord is also referred to as Jacob's trouble, or it's the darkness part of the day of the Lord. Jeremiah chapter 30, verses 6 and 7. Ask ye now and see whether a man doth travail with child. Why do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in travail and all faces are turned into paleness? Alas, for that day is great. What day? The day of the Lord. That day, that day is what day? The day of the Lord. That day is great. There's none like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble. It's the darkness part of the day of the Lord. Zephaniah chapter 1 verses 14 and 15 and Zephaniah chapter 2 verse 4 tells us that in the day of the Lord, the Gaza will be forsaken. The great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hastens greatly. Even the voice of the day of the Lord, the mighty man will cry there bitterly. That day, the day of the Lord, is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress. Zephaniah 2.4, for Gaza will be forsaken. Do you realize in August of 2005, we saw the Gaza being forsaken, Jews being removed from their homes in the Gaza? It was and has been forsaken, which begs the question, are we in the day of the Lord? Perhaps. In the day of the Lord, the land of...